episode 20 of Real Life, Real Gospel, sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. My name is Josh Laboris. I'm the host of this podcast, where every week we take a topic submitted by a listener, by one of you, and we just try to address it. We try to talk about it in a biblical way, in a way that's faithful to Christianity and to God, but in a way that is in touch with reality and grounded within reality. So if this is your first time listening and you are expecting, I guess, theological language or really kind of high academic language or philosophical vocabulary or whatever, I'm not going to use it. If I do occasionally use it, I it's because I think I have a really good reason to do so. And if that's the case, I will take the time to explain the terminology I'm using. So, that's kind of the background of the show. That's where we come from, and that's what we try to do. And this week, we are going to be discussing the environment. This is a topic courtesy of Kevin Dykstra. And I would encourage you, submit topics as you feel, I guess, as you feel led. If there's anything you're curious about, anything you want to hear me talk about, anything you want to be discussed on this show, um, and just send it in. I'd really appreciate to hearing from you. Now, as we move forward, this is talking about the environment, kind of, I guess, more about environmentalism. So, I guess the actions that come along with taking care of the environment and stuff like that. And I have found and seen and experienced that this is a topic, I think, that sometimes gets really caught up in partisan political arguments. I know a couple weeks ago I did a podcast on politics. And this was actually, this was one of the, at the beginning of the episode, I said, here's a list of tangents that I'm not going to discuss in this episode, but I can discuss later if you would like. And this is one of those tangents. What I want to be clear here is that this podcast is not a political discussion. I did a separate podcast on that. If you want a political discussion, I would encourage you, after you finish this podcast, go and listen to Real Life, Real Politics. It's out there. It's for you. But what I do want to say in regards to politics is I think this is one of the most salient examples, the one, one of the most accessible examples where conservative biblically, conservative Christianity doesn't equal conservative politics. And that's an idea that I, I tried to get at a little bit in my politics episode, but here it becomes really apparent because conservative politicians don't necessarily have environmentalism high on their list of things to be worried about. And I think what we're going to see going forward is that we ought to consider it a little more if we're being faithful to the scriptures. So with that, this is episode 20 of Real Life, Real Gospel, Real Environmentalism, Real Gospel. And we're going to get straight into the text, and it's we're going to start very early in the scriptures in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You shall you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So, what we have here, this is part of the creation story. The first two chapters of Genesis, this is obviously after God created the world, but as he's setting forth how the world is meant to work, he, he puts Adam in the garden and says, take care of it. Work it and keep it. This is God giving Adam purpose within creation, which I have a little bit of a tangent on, but it's a connected tangent. This is before the fall into sin. This is before creation was broken. And Adam is being given work to do. 
You see, work itself is not evil. Vocation is a good thing. And vocation is a word, it, I think it get used, gets used, not frequently, but it gets used in our society as kind of um, a substitute for the word career. And in a lot of places, I think it can be used with maybe a, I don't want to say a negative connotation, but a negative connotation when you talk about stuff like vocational school. Um, that's not what I mean when I say vocation. When I say vocation, I mean kind of a purpose or a calling for God, from God in your life. And, and living out your vocation, this includes things like, like your job. Like my vocation as a vicar, vocation as a pastor, vocation as a teacher, vocation as a real estate broker, vocation as a restaurant manager. Like whatever your job is, God has put you there for a reason. So there's the vocational aspect of that, but then vocation also can be used in context of your vocation as a father your vocation as a son, your vocation as a brother or sister, your vocation as a daughter or mother, your vocation as friend, your vocation as husband or wife. So it's all of these roles that we play in our life, God-given roles, and it talks about how we live those out. So I, I'm framing that, first of all, because I use the word vocation, which I count as a theological word, so I wanted to explain it. But the reason I kind of get at this is environmentalism, I think, is a sometimes a question of work, is a question of effort. So as we go forward, I want to I wanna lay this kind of under structure that work itself is not evil. I think sometimes we have this idea that work is something that is undesirable, that we don't want to do work, that the ideal existence is not doing work, and I, I don't know if that's the case. I think doing work where God has called you to be is one of the greatest joys in the world. I know I've been a vicar here for 10 months now. And there, I think there's been exactly one day where I didn't particularly want to go into work. And I think it's because I had, I, I don't even remember, I think I had like a ton of paperwork or something to do, where I was, I was filling out something for the seminary for my educational requirements that I wasn't thrilled about. But regardless, every other day of these 10 months have been, it's just a joy. Even, even as I'm working here at home, I, I'm excited about the work I get to do. And there's no way that I'd rather not have to work. That I'd rather not do what I'm getting to do. So I think when you're, you're in a position like that, when you're, you're in a position where you know you are where God has equipped you to be, where God wants you to be, where God is working through you, I think there's a joy to that. So, we have this underpinning that I want to set with work. And then I want to go into the text. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden to work and keep it. He put Adam, he put mankind in a position of stewardship for his creation. He's calling Adam here to take care of the environment. And this word, he's, he's put in the garden to work and keep it. This When he says keep it, it means to take care of, to guard it, to protect it. So this is a pretty inescapable call to take care of the environment we live in. So what does that look like today? Because it it's not just taking care of a garden, whatever that looked like in the Garden of Eden. It looks different today. A couple examples that I thought of, one is not using chemicals that are bad for the environment. If something has all sorts of warnings on it about how bad it is for the environment, maybe try not to use it. There are a lot of alternatives. 
for I don't for cleaning supplies for fertilizer for pesticides stuff like that there are alternatives out there that are less harmful for the environment and sometimes I guess they are a little more expensive or they don't work quite as well but we're called to take care of the environment so if the chemicals we're using are contrary to that then maybe it's worth the sacrifice so that's one example I thought of um, I don't know how applicable that is because I think a lot of the chemicals and and cleaning supplies and everything we use I think it is, it is better regulated than people give it credit for um, another example that I thought of is just recycle and I think this comes down to don't waste resources you know and yeah it's it's effort to sort your recyclables and to maybe take them if if it doesn't get picked up at your home to maybe take them to a recycling center but how easy is that to do like it, it's really when you think about it in the grand scheme of things it's not that much effort to recycle and uh, a tangent if you want to if you want to hear more about recycling there's a really great podcast out there called stuff you should know it's a great podcast. When my wife and I did a road trip this past summer, we listened to dozens of episodes of this podcast. And they do a really excellent episode about recycling and about the best ways to go about it. Because just throwing recyclables in, in the appropriate bin isn't always necessarily actually helpful. For example, if you say you have a couple uh, several bottles that you put in recycling that all have just a little bit of orange juice left in them if those all make it into a a huge bundle at a recycling center the product the resulting product is contaminated by that orange juice by that residual stuff in the bottle and if there's a great enough percentage of contaminants in the this gigantic unit of recycled material, it is more cost effective for a lot of these companies to just throw it out instead of having to go through and clean everything. So one example they talk about when you're recycling, if you're responsibly recycling, you clean out your stuff before you recycle it. If it's connected to something that's not recyclable, you don't recycle it or you take the unrecyclable part off. For example, pizza boxes cannot be recycled because of all the grease that gets on them and in them from the pizza. That's a huge contaminant and that the unit of cardboard that that becomes a part of will probably have to get thrown out. So... That's a little tangent. If you want to hear more about responsible recycling, I would encourage you on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on, you can probably go and listen to Stuff You Should Know as well. They have a lot of uh, very interesting topics. So anyway, more ideas about what does it look like to take care of the environment today. Don't rip your catalytic converter off your car. I've heard of places that this is a popular thing to do. I don't know why. It makes your car louder and smellier. And you just let plumes of disgusting gas out the back. But I, I, the arguments I've heard is, I guess, it marginally increases your fuel efficiency. But I've also only seen ever seen this done on trucks. And if you're really going for fuel efficiency maybe you shouldn't have gotten a truck. So, and in connection, so for those of you who are unaware, a catalytic converter is part of the exhaust system on the car, and it helps to take some of the more harmful gases out from the exhaust and, and renders them inert, in a way of speaking. So, and disclaimer, I'm not a mechanic. I... I kind of know my way around a car but not well enough to like I could have the the co the basic concept of this wrong but I know it's part of the exhaust system and it ki it makes the exhaust cleaner for the environment um, but on this note 
when you're getting a car, maybe fuel efficiency is something worth considering. And so that's that's all I'm going to speak to that. I'm not going to tell you get an electric car because, frankly, I don't know how much better they actually are for the environment because down the line somewhere, someone is making that electricity. And if you're most people, the electricity that you get and consume is probably from a coal plant. So... Anyway, and one last thing kind of on what, what taking care of the environment looks like today, using reusable bottles, which I think is, it's really easy to make that transition now because it's kind of more sanitary too, to have your own bottle that you're taking places and using, so, and then you're not throwing away paper, or plastic, or styrofoam cups everywhere. Uh, I, for example, I have an I don't think I'm going to get sponsored for this, but I have a hydrocell, I guess, flask. I, I don't, it's a 32 ounce bottle and it's, in, it's like double walled, insulated, also indestructible. I have dropped it down the stairs on more than one occasion, never intentionally. And all I have are some nice dents. Um, it's great. It cost me like 20 bucks. So reusable and just reusable things in general, like reusable shopping bags. Which, frankly, I use for no other reason than I don't want a ton of plastic shopping bags all over my pantry. Like, we have a few because sometimes when we go grocery shopping, we forget our reusable bags. But, like, I don't need four giant bags of reusable bags. I just don't need that in my life. So, anyway, so those are just some basic ideas. If you have any ideas and you're listening on one of the platforms that enables comments, I'd love for you to post them below. What are some ideas you have for taking care of the environment, for keeping the environment and guarding it and taking care of it, etc., etc.? And i got to be honest with you guys, I feel like I could almost end the podcast here. I won't, because I, I do have two more Bible lessons prepared, but there's not a lot of space here for argument. We are called to take care of the world. Period. I mean, we can have discussions about applications, but I think a lot of these are just obvious. And for regular people, there's only so many different ways this really plays out. Don't leave trash places. Recycle. Take care of your car so it's not spewing gas all over the place if you're getting if you have to get a new car think about fuel efficiency as you do so it's it's not like you really have to move mountains a lot of the the decisions that people get into huge arguments about about power plants and and stuff like that they're way above any of our pay grades so just do what you can um so the reality is there's a lot less debate about this than most of my issues. If we are faithfully living as Christians, we should be taking care of the environment. That is the reality. And I'm, I'm willing to be pretty strong on that because I think that is the reality that we find in Scripture. The gospel here, though, is that, that God has created an incredible world around us. And this world that we're taking care of, the world that is His... It's for our benefit. Like, we benefit from cleaner. I was just talking to a friend the other day. He moved out of St. Louis, which doesn't have great air quality. He moved to an area that has much cleaner air. And uh, a medical thing that he's been struggling with, it, it, it wasn't completely resolved, but it was helped drastically just by the cleaner air, air that he now lives in. So when we do stuff like take care of the air and recycle... It's, it's better off for us, really. Um, but with that, I want to I step into our gospel lesson for the day, and that is John from John 6. It says, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him, because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crown was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 
Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough to get them a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is indeed a prophet who has come to the world. So, textual notes, I don't think I have to spend a lot of time explaining this text because it's an iconic story of Jesus' ministry. But where I want to focus and, and draw your focus to, draw our focus to, within this story is after they had eaten their fill. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftovers that nothing might be lost. You see, here we have Jesus not letting the food go to waste. He teaches us a lesson about his character here that nothing might be lost. He, he's conserving. And presumably he's reusing because I'm assuming that that bed, that those 12 baskets of, of bread were then eaten at some point. He, he's also, he's, there's no better way to put it. He's picking up after himself. Jesus isn't just leaving a mess behind. And so that's kind of what I want to, and apply to the environment. Don't let things go to waste. Pick up after ourselves. And you might say that this is a weak point. You'd say, well, Josh, this is a bit of a stretch. I don't really think this passage is about environmentalism. And, and you're right, it's not. But we see the character of a God who does value taking care of the things that have been given to us he values nothing being lost, things not being wasted. Um, so we, we kind of have that. But there is a reality, and this is something I'm going to admit. In the scriptures, a lot of the environmental issues that we face today haven't really been directly addressed. Because they didn't exist yet. They didn't really have many sources of pollution not nearly on the scale we do today. They didn't have plastics and styrofoam and papers and stuff in, in such quantities that recycling was a concern. So because they didn't exist that, um, there, there is this element that we kind of have to absorb evidence from Scripture indirectly to speak to this issue. But I do think it speaks to this issue. And there's this other reality that on the scale they were speaking of, it just made sense to recycle and take care of the world around you because you didn't want to ruin the water you drank from. But a lot of the natural resources that we rely on that might be impacted by our actions and our decisions, we're layers removed from them. For example, I, frankly, I don't know where my water comes from. I know that, like, I, I know it comes from pipes, and it's piped in from some natural source somewhere down the line. And before it's, like, between the natural source and myself, I know there's water treatment facilities and stuff like that. So I'm not incompetent. I'm not an idiot. But, like, I don't know specifically what reservoir or stream or river or aquifer. Like, I don't, I don't know where my water is drawn from. So I don't have that immediate connection with if I'm not taking care of the environment around me, it's it's not directly impacting me immediately. Whereas back in Jesus' time, I think there was a more direct, immediate impact. If you ruined the water by your city, you were out of water. And it directly impacted you probably pretty quickly. So they just took care of the environment around them because it's what they survived on. So, the, all of this to say the reality of this passage is Jesus took care of the environment around him. He cleaned up for the sake of the people around him. 
And this is something we should em em emulate. Emulate. That's the word I was looking for. And yes, I know I could cut that out, but I feel like hopefully it'll be at least a little entertaining for someone out there, so I'll leave it in. Anyway, the gospel here, the, the joy I think we can find in this passage, is that Jesus also provides via the earth. He, he provides by way of the earth, and he, he walks alongside us in this. So, and he takes care of his, the people who follow him, which is all really cool, great stuff. Finally, our epistle comes from Romans 8. It says, For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in order that creation itself shall will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So textual notes on this passage from Romans is it's connecting us to creation on an intimate level. And it, it points us forward to the redemption of creation and our own redemption at, at Jesus' second coming. When the, the creation will be renewed and we will be renewed and glory and forgiveness and grace and honor and all of those incredible things. But the reality that I want to draw, the, the thing that I want to draw out from this passage is creation is broken by our sin. Just as we are broken and we, we have this sinful nature that we have to strive with, creation too has been cursed and broken and corrupted by our actions and by our ancestors' actions. So I... As I speak to this, yes, we have to take care of the environment. Yes, we, we have to be responsible. We have to be stewards of our resources, etc., etc. I, I want to speak to the other side, too, in that we can't fix creation. There is nothing we can do, no policy that can be enacted, no practice that can be started that will bring the world to some sort of perfection. This doesn't mean we don't try and help, we don't try and take care of it, but it does mean that by taking some radical steps, we're not, we're not going to suddenly have a perfect natural world. And the analogy I want to use to maybe explain my position on this is something I kind of mentioned earlier in a completely unrelated part. And that is, I want to use a car and a mechanic analogy. As, as I may have told you guys, I, I, know a, I know more about cars than probably the average person. But far, far less than a mechanic. So, when my car has things it needs, like an oil change, or the tires filled, or the tires rotated, or more wiper fluid, like a lot of these basic fundamental things... Or when I wired a sub in, beside the point. I can do those things, and I can take care of my car in that way. That being said, it is a car, it is a machine, and I live in an environment where this the air itself has salt water all over the place. So, my car is going to have more serious issues. And the reality is, I can't fix those. No matter how well I take care of the car, eventually it's going to have a problem that I can't fix. So what do I do? I take it to a mechanic. I wait to get to the mechanic, and then the mechanic fixes it. So in the same way, we take care of the creation around us. Just like I change the oil on my car and, and do all these maintenance things, we recycle we, we reuse, we don't waste, we don't dump harmful chemicals into, the, into places they don't belong. But we have this understanding that we're waiting for a mechanic to fix the serious problem, to fix the core issue. And the mechanic in this analogy, of course, is Jesus, is God. So there's this reality that creation is groaning with anticipation. It is waiting for that renewal. And 
the other thing I want to take out of this passage is we are we are intimately c connected to creation. And there's this element of responsibility. We broke it in the first place. We ought to take care of it until it's better. So the reality is creation is broken. We can do our best to take care of it, but it is still broken. It still waits for that new creation. But the gospel that I want to close on today is that a new creation is coming. Jesus will return again, and when he does, the world will be will be renewed, and, and so will we. So, that is all I have for you today. This has been episode 20 of Real Life, Real Gospel. I would encourage you, subscribe on whatever platform you listen to this on. We are on Podbean and Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, iTunes, and YouTube. I suspect that most people probably listen on YouTube. If you do listen on YouTube, I would I would definitely encourage you subscribe. There's a link that's going to be on the pit, on one of the corners of the viewing video. There's also a subscribe button down below the video. Go ahead and click that, and then you'll you'll get access and you'll get connected to all the other incredible resources that Saint Paul has via our YouTube page. We have Bible studies, we have devotions, we have worship services, all of this stuff. Um, available for you to help connect you to the Word, connect you to God. So we have all that. Also, I encourage you, like the video if you found it helpful. Share it with your friends, um, especially if you have friends who would disagree with me. I, I would love to have that discussion. If, if you disagree with me, give me a comment. Let me know, and uh, we'll have that discussion. So, with that, this has been Real Life, Real Gospel, Episode 20, Christianity and Environmentalism. Hope it was helpful. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.